shores of Lake Michigan to the Santa Monica Pier. It's a ribbon of concrete, steel, and kitsch. Now, Route 66 on Modern Marvels. the main road to the Pacific. A patchwork of trails, roads, and main streets cobbled together under the umbrella of an interstate highway that traveled three quarters of the way across the country. But Route 66 has always been more than the sum of its parts. More than just a way for a car to travel from Chicago to Los Angeles. It embodies an idea central to the American myth, the belief that something better is just over the horizon. So people like me, writers and poets and musicians and photographers and artists and even dancers, have interpreted Route 66. It's a metaphor for all of these other routes. Today it exists as a symbol. The route was decommissioned when superhighways moved more people faster. But that symbol still sends us searching for vestiges of what author John Steinbeck called the Mother Road. Along stretches of old concrete, over abandoned bridges, in rusted signs welcoming ghosts to faded diners, auto camps, and motels. It was a 2,400 mile carnival. The barbecue pits with all this wonderful aroma uh, wafting through the car, the uh, diners, the motels with their wild neon that just looks so great. There was something almost along every inch to get your dollar because in those days, most people were driving to California to stay and figured they got one shot at you. That cross-country carnival celebrated technology that became state-of-the-art. For paving, bridge building, and traveling itself. Even though the roads that made up Route 66 existed long before the government marked and posted the road with signs, throughout its existence, it generated engineering projects that kept traffic moving and men working. Its days as an interstate are gone. But the road carries on as living, breathing nostalgia. A place you can still visit if you're willing to get off the superhighway. On Route 66, the future is the past. Welcome to the Route 66 Museum in Pontiac, Illinois. And the Route 66 Museum in McLean, Texas. And the vintage independent gas station in Monrovia, California. Stop by the Blue Swallow Motel. The Route 66 Drive-In Theater. Or Cuckoo Drive-In Restaurant. Stroll through Main Street Galena. These places and others like them are beacons, not just to Americans, but visitors from all over the world. There you go, thank you very much. We're coming to see the real America, and there's nowhere in the rest of the world that you can package the real America, let alone Route 66, that wonderful 2,400-mile museum now. Route 66 starts in Chicago, but it really began in the early 20th century, when a confluence of technologies merged with a set of compelling facts. The technologies are familiar enough. The automobile invented in the late 19th century was being transformed from an expensive novelty into a necessary tool. So as the car developed and as people like Ford made the automobile affordable for the common person, for the clerk, for the school teacher, for the farmer, and not just a play toy of the rich, we needed more roads. Auto enthusiasts pressured Congress for better roads, but the lure of interstate commerce convinced them. Roads allowed trucks to move goods from places railroads couldn't easily reach. Small farms and remote communities across the Midwest and the West. Rural 
towns wanted big city goods, and vice versa. Two of the biggest cities were Chicago and Los Angeles. Los Angeles was the major shipping port on the west coast, and Chicago was really the furthest inland that any boats could get from the Atlantic Ocean side via the Great Lakes. So the choice between Chicago and Los Angeles was primarily a commerce route. Congress passed a series of acts in the teens and 20s, making funds available to states for creating and improving roads. The first was the Federal Road Act of 1916, but more significant was the Federal Highway Act of 1921, which offered funds for interstate highways. The need was great. In 1920, only 36,000 miles of America's roads were negotiable by automobile. Some were paved, most were dirt. Some of them were old Indian trails. So when the car came along, a lot of the roads were not car friendly. The roads were terribly congested with all these cars. And if you think about it, uh, there weren't just cars, there were trucks, there were still horse-drawn vehicles, there were buses. A planned series of major routes from city to city across state borders spidered across the country. These interstate highways maintained a single ID, or route number, from one state to the next, codifying a national system of roads. In 1923, Oklahoma Highway Commissioner Cyrus Avery was named Consulting Highway Specialist to the United States Bureau of Public Roads. He was instrumental in turning federal funds into drivable roadways. The goal of Avery and his colleagues was not necessarily to build new roads, but to improve existing ones connecting urban and rural areas. Avery's committee chose as one of its most important transcontinental conduits, a highway that began in Chicago and followed a route between the northern Santa Fe Trail and the southern Butterfield stage line to the Pacific. The route would take travelers through territory that was fewer than 50 years earlier, inhabited by Native Americans, frontier boom towns, and buffalo. It was a series of trails and traces, historic, many of them very, very old. And they had been well-used roads, familiar roads, so it was a no-brainer. Let's connect these roads. Heading south out of Illinois, the route turned due west in Oklahoma, with the goal of sending trucks loaded with goods through relatively temperate southern climes. But Avery, who is sometimes called the father of Route 66, may have had an ulterior motive. I don't think it's a coincidence that he had a business on Route 66, but he definitely wanted it in his hometown. He definitely wanted to boost Oklahoma, and he was, you know, willing to fight like hell to get it. Avery's committee originally wanted to call the road Route 60, but another route back east got the name first. So the committee came up with Route 66, thinking it might be catchy. And finally, it became this reality. And in, in November of 1926, we, we had Route 66 officially born and created and ready to go to work. Illinois was one of only two states where every mile of Route 66 was already paved at its inception. Only 800 of the more than 2,400 miles of Route 66 were paved in 1926. The route began in Chicago to facilitate commerce coming off Lake Michigan and nearby railroads. But it was more than just a commerce route. People were captivated by new vehicles, new cars, and new roads in the mid-1920s. And Route 66 embodied that giddy time. From Lake Michigan's shore past Al Capone's town of Cicero, through Abe Lincoln's Springfield, Route 66 travels over prairie. It undoubtedly served as a whiskey route for bootleggers moving hooch from Canada into speakeasies throughout the Midwest during the late 1920s. But when Route 66 reaches the Missouri border, it hits a hurdle, the Mississippi River. Route 66 needed an engineering marvel to overcome this barrier. On May 26, 1928, Andy Payne of Royal, Oklahoma won the first and only Bunyan Derby. A foot race along Route 66 from Los Angeles to Chicago. Route 66 will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Route 66 on Modern Marvels. North of St. Louis, near where the Mississippi and Missouri Rivers join, is an old bridge that was from 1936 to 1968, the main gateway to Missouri for travelers along Route 66. These days, it's open only to pedestrians, but not too long ago, it was packed with vehicles crossing the river. The chain of rock
Knox Bridge has become one of the key landmarks along Old Route 66. But it wasn't initially even part of the route when the highway was commissioned in 1926. It was adopted in 1936. Throughout its nearly 60-year history, Route 66 underwent numerous realignments, alterations in its path that often, though not always, improved its ability to send traffic where it needed to go. From almost the moment that the highway became official, changes were begun. Uh, dangerous curves were taken out, bridges were replaced, uh, railroad crossings were given grade separations, and so the highway immediately began to change. Early realignments occurred in Missouri, where the road took traffic straight through the heart of bustling St. Louis. Meanwhile, north of the city, a private consortium was planning a toll bridge across the Mississippi. The idea seemed simple enough, but to the engineers of this new span, it must have been one nightmare after another, beginning with the flow of the river. The velocity of the chain of rocks was one of the highest in the entire river. That makes it tougher to build piers with the water moving so quickly. So it's just not a very good spot to put a bridge. That was only the beginning of the complications. The consortium had already purchased land on both sides of the river, dictating that the bridge would have to cross at an angle to the river channel. Not an ideal situation from a navigation perspective. But prominent city waterworks intake towers just downstream compelled river pilots to insist on a radical alteration to the planned path. And if the bridge had been put in as was originally planned, they would have had multiple obstacles to navigation. Now, they ended up convincing the War Department, which in those days gave the permits for the bridge, to require that the main navigation span of the bridge be placed basically squared in the navigation channel. And also in the process, the center pier of the main bridge would shield and protect somewhat the water intake tower. The only way to resolve the navigation dilemma was to build part of the bridge square to the navigation channel, then turn it toward the shore, where the consortium had its property. The Chain of Rocks Bridge was designed with a 22-degree dog leg. Then there was the challenge of sinking coffer dams, large, hollow, watertight, reinforced boxes that are excavated into the riverbed to build the bridge piers. Since the piers are going down to bedrock, you are relying on the embedment of the coffer dam in the soil above the bedrock to keep it stable. And when you have high velocity, the Mississippi River uh, scours a lot, and it is possible to scour down to bedrock. The force of the river is so strong here, it literally strips the bottom soil away. That's scouring. And that could lead to the failure of the coffer dam because there's nothing really restraining it at that point. Engineers overcame the challenges the river posed, and the rest of the bridge was built without incident. The steel support structure went up efficiently, reinforced near the center of the bridge to give it greater rigidity. When completed, the bridge was more than a mile long. More memorably, it was only 20 feet wide and felt even narrower at the bend. I can remember in a couple occasions during an ice storm with my father crossing that bridge in a sedan and feeling sort of like a hockey puck as we hit that dog leg and then we're careening over towards the Illinois bank and here come trucks up the road and it's a narrow bridge. It was just those two lanes of danger over the Mississippi. The private consortium that built the bridge had the misfortune of opening it on the eve of the Great Depression. There were too few five-cent tolls collected to keep them in business. But the Missouri Department of Transportation saw in the bridge an opportunity. Highway engineers sought to realign interstate traffic away from the hubbub and congestion downtown using the now bankrupt Chain of Rocks Bridge. The bridge remained the official Route 66 crossing for three decades, until this part of the highway was decommissioned in 1968. Missouri's section of Route 66 followed the historic Great Osage Trail, an Indian trading route, and passed through towns such as Springfield and Joplin. But south of Rolla, a realignment called Hooker Cut made use of cutting-edge technology, literally. Road engineers sliced right through the mountainside. Hooker Cut, actually, about its deepest point, is about 93 foot cut into the mountain. It's 86 foot wide, and 
There's 186,000 cubic yards approximately of uh, rock that came out of that cut. Now, that 186,000 cubic yards of rock weighed probably around 300,000 tons. And to give you a, an idea of the size of or the volume of that material coming out, if you was to take that material and place it down on the football field, and spread it across the football field, it would actually stack to be 100 foot, over 100 foot tall. Hooker cut proved to be one of the most dramatic realignments of Route 66. The need for improved access to nearby Fort Leonard Wood necessitated the realignment. And you needed a way to move troops quickly to the new base. So the Missouri State Highway Department decided to build a four-lane road leading to the military base. It's about 22 feet wide on either side with two 11-foot lanes, whereas the original road was only 19 feet wide and crossed a bridge that was, again, only 19 feet wide with about a 12-foot clearance. So there was no way a military vehicle or any military equipment could be moved to the military base. Cutting straight through the Ozark landscape rather than following its natural contours was a formidable task. In order to create a new and improved 66, the St. Louis-based contractor had to take his unwieldy equipment over the old narrow route to deliver it to the site. They used steam-powered drills to drill fissure holes into the rock and then place dynamite and explosives down in there and literally blow apart the mountain in order to cut through it. And it took almost two years to complete this process. Despite these difficulties, Hooker Cut broke ground, not only physically, but also in highway design. This rock cut here was designed with a bench in it at the top there. Uh, that's a standard practice nowadays. We'll go up 30 foot, and then we'll cut uh, back in 15 foot as for a bench, and then go up another 30 foot. And that is because if a piece of rock or something like that from the very top of the hill was to fall down and hit the car down here, that rock will fall down and hit that bench versus coming all the way down the hill. This project became one of the first four lane sections of Route 66. It would incorporate new and largely untested design features, such as a median strip to separate traffic traveling in different directions, and a beveled curve, which was intended to sluice rainwater toward gutters. Upon completion in 1946, Booker Cut became the deepest limestone cut in Missouri, and possibly the entire country. Though it would take years before improvements like cuts and divided highways were widespread, they would ultimately do winding old Route 66. Because of that, they uh, were able to eventually build roads such as Interstate 44, which is just to the north of here, without having to uh, follow the topography of the land. After leaving Missouri, Route 66 wanders for 13 miles through Kansas, the only other state besides Illinois to have paved its portion of the highway by 1926. As the United States entered the 1930s, Route 66 was about to become the most important road in America. In 1935, Lester Dill opened Missouri's Merrimack Caverns as a roadside attraction, promoting it with billboards and painted barns along Route 66. He even placed ads on visitors' cars and is credited with inventing the bumper sticker. Route 66 will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Route 66 on Modern Marvels. Miami, Oklahoma, is home to a stretch of rare and authentic Route 66. That's actually older than the route itself. It's earned these various nicknames, like the Scotch Highway, or the Ribbon Road, or my favorite name, it's the Sidewalk Highway. This roughly four-mile stretch of road may be one of the rarest pieces of original 66 service along the entire route, but it's still enduring obvious wear and tear. More people know what I'm talking about when I say sidewalk highway. They know where it is, they can find it. The one thing that saved this particular part is there are a lot of farms out here, and this is really the only access that people have to their land. Born in 1922, this piece of original roadway is only nine feet across. In those days, when the state received federal funds to build and improve roads, it cost a whopping $40,000 per mile to pave an 18-foot wide track. Legend has it, thrifty engineers determined if they built their road only half as wide, they could pave it twice as far. Nine foot it was, even by 1920 standards, would not have been a two-lane paved road. It would have been a one-lane paved road. Undoubtedly, at the time, that decision was driven by the desire to have an all-weather road, to get up out of the mud and be able to go from one town to the other. Well, at least it was paved. During its early, more adventurous years, whole sections of Route 66 weren't. In fact, all sorts of unorthodox services were considered good enough. Well, we had three different versions of dirt. We had just dirt highways, and we had what's in our archives termed as improved dirt and oiled dirt. We would have gravel highways. By the mid-teens, 
more than 2,000 U.S. roads were surfaced with Portland cement. During the 1930s, efforts were underway to pave Route 66, as well as all of the nation's interstates. And by 1938, all of Route 66 was paved, much of it with Portland cement. It goes down quick. Materials for it are easy to obtain for the most part. However, a lot of things factored in, depending on what kind of budget a local jurisdiction was working with. Back in the 30s, paving Route 66 was no different than paving any other road. Pouring a cement roadbed usually involved placing the mixture right on the underlying soil. We used wooden forms to hold the sides of the concrete up, mix the uh, concrete on site, and they deposited it in front of the paving screed. The screed, or leveling board, following behind would level the surface. If they were lucky, they had a type of mixture that actually was rode up on the forms ahead of where the paving operation was going on and they had a little boom system. Once they mixed the concrete, they could dump it into a bucket and pulley it out on a boom and then deposit it where they wanted to. Pulling up the rear, men with trowels would do the final finishing. The only other challenge to laying a concrete roadway was sufficient manpower. The process was labor intensive, but as efforts to pave all of Route 66 gathered steam throughout the late 1920s and early 1930s, America was gripped by a devastating financial collapse that threw millions of men out of work. The disastrous human conditions brought on by the Great Depression produced an endless supply of cheap labor as migrants searching for a better life found work on the road. I talked to an old man out in western Oklahoma, long gone, who was a young farmer with a young wife on what became Route 66. He remembered the laying of the concrete, the crude machinery, the men, many of them migrants who stopped to get a job, long, long hours. And Every night, he'd get his young wife, and they'd take a wind-up Victrola and some other young couples, and they'd go out to the new highway, and they would turn the music on, and they would dance on the road. And they did that all the way across western Oklahoma till the road went into Texas. They danced on the mother road. Many of those young farmers became migrants after years of poor farming techniques aggravated by a hellish drought crippled farm communities throughout the Midwest. As depleted topsoil was blown away by dry summer winds, it created a dust bowl where once there had been bountiful crops. These two disasters conspired to drive many tenant farmers off land they'd worked for generations. The rain literally stopped. It was just a terrible time in America's breadbasket right on the heart of this new highway of Route 66. That's where you had the Okies and the folks from the heart of the Dust Bowl itself taking to the road in large numbers, legions of people. The largest migration we've ever had in this country. Route 66 became the conduit for more than 200,000 of these migrants headed for California. That's when the road symbolically started to roll up its sleeves. This is when it started paying its dues. Author John Steinbeck immortalized their journey in his classic novel, The Grapes of Wrath. The road that had once captivated with a promise of something better, now compelled with the reality that things could get no worse. That's when Route 66, as Steinbeck so aptly named it, became the mother road. For the Okies who traveled that road, it became a road of promise. Here they are in these old cars with tires about as thin as cigarette paper with all their lives and hopes lashed to this vehicle, and they're traveling west. They're following the scent of the orange blossoms, the smell of the Pacific surf, and they're hoping to rebuild their life. Many clutched mass-produced handbills that promised agricultural work in California. Many were turned away, or were even beaten by local vigilantes. Some simply died of despair by the side of Route 66. As the route straightened due west through towns like Catoosa, Hydro, and Elk City, Oklahoma, and into the Texas Panhandle, it passed by general stores, diners, and gas stations, oases in the otherwise poverty-stricken communities of the heartland. A service industry grew up along Route 66. Waitresses and mechanics watched the desperate and the hungry drift by. They needed food. They needed gas, and their pennies sustained businesses along the way. They were fleeing from starvation, 
and indebtedness. These were people that had to find the promised land or they were going to die. And of course, that come across to the people that served, and that's what provided the heart to help those people. Not everyone helped. Vigilantes and bandits plagued travelers. Route 66 threw a punch as easily as it extended a hand. But enough did help. Attendants, waitresses, and campsite operators. Some even made their careers assisting travelers. In McLean, Texas, the very first Phillips 66 gas station in the Lone Star State is also one of the earliest surviving gas stations anywhere. Built in 1929, it's been restored to its original glory. Uh, we bought the building and we restored it to what it is today and had lots of help. Again, the city helped us and people donated things. And uh, so it, it is probably the most well-known icon on the road today. Frank Phillips began Phillips Petroleum Company in 1917 in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. He started marketing gasoline on a retail level and he didn't know what to call the gasoline. So he sent one of his vice presidents to Oklahoma City to pick a name and they were on Route 66. And this exec looked over and he said, we must be doing 60 miles an hour. And the old driver said, 60? Hell, we're doing 66. Doing 66 on Route 66. And when he got back to Bartlesville and told Frank Phillips, he said, that's it. We're calling it Phillips 66. Toward the end of the 1930s, as America began to recover from the Depression, Europe plunged into war. Route 66 would soon take on a new identity. Approximately 80% of original Route 66 roadway survives and is drivable between Chicago and Los Angeles. Route 66 will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Route 66 on Modern Marvels. Some of the roadway that was originally incorporated into Route 66 back in 1926 is very old. But this section in New Mexico is positively ancient. Evidence uncovered by the side of the road here suggests this piece of Route 66 may predate the earliest known European visitors of the 16th century. This was a path Native Americans used long before automobiles were invented. That connection right here. Instead of gas station signs and interstate route shields, off-roaders can find truly vintage roadside graffiti. There was a settlement, prehistoric settlement, along the Rio Santa Fe. For example, there are some housing block remains around here that date to pre-colonial times. portion of Route 66, known as the La Bajada Switchbacks, certainly has the longest history. It's also the most treacherous, dropping 600 scary feet to the valley below. It did scare people. Some of the grades were as great as 22%, which uh, prompted many people to uh, actually have to back up the road because their uh, gravity-based fuel pumps were unable to draw gasoline into the motor if they were uh, going straight ahead. Crews in the 1920s worked to make the road car friendly. This meant carving switchbacks into the hill. Paving was still out of question. They would blast through these solid basalt columns, and then they would take the rubble, then build a dry masonry ashlar retaining wall on the outside. In other words, there was no uh, concrete use. Then a curb was usually added above the retaining wall. In 1932, Route 66 bypassed it with a section of paved road four miles east. La Bajada soon drifted back into obscurity. Route 66 stretches across New Mexico's plateaus and mountains, past Santa Rosa, through Albuquerque, and on towards Gallup. A conduit for the homeless and jobless throughout the 1930s. During World War II, Route 66 became important for transporting troops and supplies, especially here in the Southwest. Everybody was manufacturing guns and airplanes and tanks and so forth. So it really was a war road. Many military bases were positioned adjacent to Route 66 in the deserts of Arizona and California. By the time World War II ended in 1945, 
Route 66 really was ready to go. As the country emerged from war, Route 66 went through another transformation. From the honky-tonk road of 1926, through the dust and desperation of 1933, to the military supply line of 1942, Route 66 would become the neon tourist trap of 1955. A lot of the GIs who had shipped out of Los Angeles and San Diego wanted to come back and vacation there and bring their families there. So there was a lot of tourism happening throughout the United States at that time. And really, that's when 66 became more of a tourist road than a commercial highway. Route 66 brought vacationers to the Grand Canyon, the Painted Desert, and Meteor Crater in Arizona, past Winslow and Flagstaff, and Seligman and Kingman. It brought them past curio shops and diners, and a newly born American original, the themed motel. These roadside shelters evolved from primitive in the 1920s to almost luxurious in the 1950s. They went from crude lodges, little cabins, and then as the business increased, well, let's get rid of the carport next to it and fill it in. And you had just total architecture all around. They even glowed in the dark. Neon came into uh, play as an uh, inexpensive form of lighting for uh, signage that could be lighted up to attract uh, travelers into their uh, facilities to uh, stay for the night. Tourists may have been happy, but President Eisenhower was not. He'd seen Hitler's multi-lane modern high-speed autobahn as he led Allied forces to Berlin. Eisenhower wanted America to have its own autobahn. After he became president in 1953, he was ready to give it one. Two-lane roadways were inadequate for the security needs of a Cold War superpower like the United States. A series of highway bills would send Route 66 itself on the last leg of its journey. In 1946, Nat King Cole became the first artist to record Bobby Troop's classic, Get Your Kicks on Route 66. Route 66 will return on Modern Marvels. Turn to Route 66 on Modern Marvels. Seligman, Arizona. It's the annual Route 66 fun run. Hundreds of vintage and custom cars spend the weekend driving along surviving segments of old Route 66. It's not a race, and no one's in a hurry. Some come to see the nice cars, some from, for the weather, some for the friendship and the hospitality. It's a weekend-long event, but Saturday is the highlight as a parade of cars drives the 70-mile stretch from Seligman to Kingman. But parade is the wrong word. It's more of a caravan. One big, long cookout for fans and friends at Route 66. It's the moving car show that symbolizes adventure. Something about the USA, they're able to market uh, their uh, past and bring it to their future. And I say it is tempting to uh, come along and enjoy the ride. The party is a celebration of nostalgia. <laughs> To me, it means keeping the past alive. And my hope always has been and will continue to be that it will help everyone that's involved with 66 uh, slow down somewhat in their own hectic lives. Route 66 ended in California, beyond Needles, Barstow, and San Bernardino. It was realigned past Los Angeles, curving through Hollywood, and onto the Santa Monica Pier, where it connected with another great roadway, the Pacific Coast Highway and points north. During the 1950s, Route 66 was still a vital interstate, but its days were numbered the moment President Eisenhower's Federal Highway Act became law in 1955. But these new multi-lane superhighways had a precedent in an earlier stretch of Route 66 between Pasadena and Los Angeles. Begun in the 1930s, it's called the Arroyo Seco Parkway and was built in three sections, the earliest of which opened in 1940 and featured limited access, exit and entrance ramps, three lanes of traffic in each direction, and a speed limit of 45 miles an hour. 
Getting up enough speed to join the flow of traffic could be harrowing. It was a completely different configuration from your normal city street. The people actually had to be trained to learn how to get on the road. When the parkway was finally completed in the 1950s, it was incorporated into the new freeway system. Superhighways began to replace Route 66. It was a slow, sometimes agonizing death. Whole towns were cut off. By the mid-80s, Route 66 was gone. No longer identified and posted as an interstate, it drifted into obscurity as the superhighways cut off its lifeblood of tourists and truckers. The shields came down. The maps were changed. The superhighway had won. A few years later, journalist Emily Pretty and her husband Ron were traveling along the remnants of old Route 66, which in Missouri often parallels the Route 44 superhighway. Suddenly, Pretty saw a dilapidated vision from the past. I looked at that and I went, oh my God, stop the car. And I cramped on the brakes. He thought we were about to hit something. And I said, what is that? And it was a... From the shores of Lake Michigan to the Santa Monica Pier, it's a ribbon of concrete, steel, and kitsch. Now, Route 66 on Modern Marvels. central to the American myth, the belief that something better is just over the horizon. So people like me, writers and poets and musicians and photographers and artists and even dancers, have interpreted Route 66. It's a metaphor for all of these other roads. Today it exists as a symbol. The route was decommissioned when superhighways moved more people faster. But that symbol still sends us searching for vestiges of what author John Steinbeck called the Mother Road. Along stretches of old concrete, over abandoned bridges, in rusted signs welcoming ghosts to faded diners, auto camps, and motels. It was a 2400 mile carnival. The barbecue pits with all this wonderful aroma uh, wafting through the car. The uh, diners, the motels with their wild neon that just looks so great. There was something almost along every inch to get your dollar because in those days, most people were driving to California to stay. So they figured they got one shot at you. That cross-country carnival celebrated technology that became state-of-the-art for paving, bridge building, and traveling itself. Even though the roads that made up Route 66 existed long before the government marked and posted the road with signs, throughout its existence, it generated engineering projects that kept traffic moving and men working. Its days as an interstate are gone, but the road carries on as living, breathing nostalgia, a place you can still visit if you're willing to get off the superhighway. On Route 66, the future is the past. Welcome to the Route 66 Museum in Pontiac, Illinois, and the Route 66 Museum in McLean, Texas, and the Vintage Independent Gas Station in Monrovia, California. Stop by the Blue Swallow Motel, the Route 66 Drive-In Theater, 
a cuckoo drive-in restaurant. Stroll through Main Street Galena. These places and others like them are beacons, not just to Americans, but visitors from all over the world. There you go. Thank you very much. They're coming to see the real America, and there's nowhere in the rest of the world that you can package the real America, let alone Route 66, that wonderful 2,400-mile museum now. Route 66 starts in Chicago, but it really began in the early 20th century, when a confluence of technologies merged with a set of compelling facts. The technologies are familiar enough. The automobile, invented in the late 19th century, was being transformed from an expensive novelty into a necessary tool. So as the car developed and as people like Ford made the automobile affordable for the common person, for the clerk, for the school teacher, for the farmer, and not just a play toy of the rich, we needed more roads. Auto enthusiasts pressured Congress for better roads, but the lure of interstate commerce convinced them. Roads allowed trucks to move goods from places railroads couldn't easily reach. Small farms and remote communities across the Midwest and the West. Rural towns wanted big city goods, and vice versa. Two of the biggest cities were Chicago and Los Angeles. Los Angeles was the major shipping port on the West Coast, and Chicago was really the furthest inland that any boats could get from the Atlantic Ocean side via the Great Lakes. So the choice between Chicago and Los Angeles was primarily a commerce route. Congress passed a series of acts in the teens and 20s, making funds available to states for creating and improving roads. The first was the Federal Road Act of 1916, but more significant was the Federal Highway Act of 1921, which offered funds for interstate highways. The need was great. In 1920, only 36,000 miles of America's roads were negotiable by automobile. Some were paved, most were dirt. Some of them were old Indian trails. So when the car came along, a lot of the roads were not car friendly. The roads were terribly congested with all these cars. And if you think about it, uh, there weren't just cars, there were trucks, there were still horse-drawn vehicles, there were buses. A planned series of major routes from city to city across state borders spidered across the country. These interstate highways maintained a single ID, or route number, from one state to the next, codifying a national system of roads. In 1923, Oklahoma Highway Commissioner Cyrus Avery was named Consulting Highway Specialist to the United States Bureau of Public Roads. He was instrumental in turning federal funds into drivable roadways. The goal of Avery and his colleagues was not necessarily to build new roads, but to improve existing ones connecting urban and rural areas. Avery's committee chose as one of its most important transcontinental conduits, a highway that began in Chicago and followed a route between the Northern Santa Fe Trail and the southern Butterfield stage line to the Pacific. The route would take travelers through territory that was fewer than 50 years earlier, inhabited by Native Americans, frontier boom towns, and buffalo. It was a series of trails and traces, historic, many of them very, very old. And they had been well-used roads, familiar roads, so it was a no-brainer. Let's connect these roads. 